One of the bigger points that I hear in the arguments about ClimateGate is that the emails, while interesting, aren't considered the true smoking gun in the scandal. Rather, the real meat is inside a package of source code and programmer's notes that was included along with the emails. The skeptics say that in there is evidence of tampering with data and other bad behavior, and since this is source code, i.e. logic and mathematics, it's not something that can be taken out of context like a person's words in an email can. But this video is a section from a BBC report about ClimateGate. It's an interview with a software engineer named John Graham Cumming, where he talks about his concerns that he has with the CRU source code. Let's listen to the report and his points. But he is shocked by what he's seen in the programming. He compared it with code in the same language written by NASA. Well, if you look at the NASA stuff, it's really professional. You can look at it, you can see the history. If you look at the work that's done here by these alleged CRU files, it's not the sort of thing you'd expect to see, certainly in commercial industry. You would not see this kind of source code because it's not clearly documented. There's no audit history of what's happened to it. So it would be below the standard you'd expect in any commercial software. Now this sounds bad, but not if you consider the fact that this code was internally written by one programmer for a small audience of scientists. The role of documentation is to give new and incoming programmers something to read before they take over a project. The role of an audit history is to track multiple programmers working on a project at the same time, or to track the history of multiple releases. Now this code was different. It was an internal work meant to calculate the scientists' methodologies and nothing more. Further organization would not be strictly necessary unless the code was being prepared to be released to a wider audience. And the only reason this code is being shown to a wider audience is because it was hacked off their servers. Documentation and audit histories are nice, but they're not related to the correctness of the code itself. Commercial software. Okay, and um, tell me about the uh, bug that you found in one part of the program. The programming language actually has a problem, and they've put in some code to deal with that error. Unfortunately, in doing so, they've introduced another error, and the, the upshot of this is that if the error occurs, the underlying error occurs, they will skip over data that they're trying to plot without any warning to the end user. So in some senses, data in here is being lost. Now, when he points to the problem area in the code, the camera zooms in fairly close. But in an earlier shot, the camera pans over the same code, and we can see what's written above and below. First, we see above that the specific problem is that IDL will sometimes cause plotting errors in the window. But the important code is below, though. Mr. Graham Cummings says that the data is skipped over without warning the end user. However, in the code directly below the area he points at, we see this. Read plot of missing data as grid, and then, in lines below, find those areas that are white, i.e. value 255, and add these to an array of missing input points, points too. In other words, this code is taking the beginning steps of recovering the missed data. It's doing this by capturing the window that the graph plotting was taking place in, and scanning it for pure white rows and columns, referencing them against a list of the original input data. Now, I'm actually surprised that he missed that. Now, earlier in the video we see close-ups of a bit of code that's fairly well known among ClimateGate followers. We don't hear it being talked about in the BBC report, but we do catch glimpses of phrases such as highly artificial, fudge factor, and a less than helpful error message called oops. Here is the code. Now skeptics have taken a look at this code and say that it's a way of weighting the data in a graph, such that the final line bends in a way that sort of resembles the hockey stick, i.e. a famous bend in a CRU graph that CRU scientists say demonstrate global warming. Well, the comments sound suspicious in this bit of code, and what it does sound suspicious as well. Now, I'm going to give credit for this next point to a blog I found called Residual Analysis. They looked at this code too, but also they looked at the places where this code was intended to be used. The bit of code places its results in a variable called yearly ADJ. If you look below this bit though, there are two statements. One is commented out, i.e., turned into a comment, and so disabling it, and the other is not commented out. The commented out statement uses this yearly ADJ variable, but the statement not commented out is identical and does not use this variable. 
Now what seems to have happened here is that the suspicious code above was test code. A what if, perhaps used to see how the program was functioning so far, and to try out various methods. Now that's why the comments talk about how fake it is, because it was. And the programmer is reminding himself of that fact, so that this code doesn't accidentally get used normally. You see, when skeptics say that source code can't be taken out of context, they're wrong. The context of a snippet of code is the entire program that the code is inside. Any snippet of code has to have its output used or placed somewhere else in the program, and in that sense, code is absolutely context-sensitive.